So according to VentureJapan.com, um, Japan is the second largest foreign investor um, with over $257 billion invested alone from just the United States. So um, they do a lot of import important exports and um, just wanted to welcome y'all to um, get some more information about Japan. We're very happy and pleased to hear that you request more information. We are from the International Consulting Agency and we are specialized in Japan, so we're able to provide um, all the, the information you need. Today, um, I myself will talk about the culture. Um, my name is Sue Castillo. Then we have Julian Salazar, who will talk about the economy. Next, we have Brendan Helpercat, who will talk about business management. And last, we'll have Brendan Maynard, who will talk about how to start your business in Japan. We ask that you please hold all your questions to the end. We will have a Q&A session. We will be very happy to answer any of your questions. OK, so like I said, my name is Cindy Castillo. I have studied abroad in Japan for two semesters, and I have worked with this agency for six years already. Um, and today, I will just basically talk about the Japanese society um, relationships and communications in Japan, and last, um, about the business etiquette. So to start, um, the Japanese society. So according to factsaboutjapan.com, harmony is a key value in family, business settings, and in society as a whole. Um, if you have ever visited Japan, you, you would you witness that everybody's very polite, um, nice, just welcoming and very uh, positive. Um, this is because since they were very young, the, uh, the educational system teaches them to be the inter interdependence of everyone. They do not teach them to be independent or like um, to be competitive against each other. Um, instead, they teach them to work with one another for the success of everyone. Um, and this is where the Japanese Kiritsu comes into place. This is their a system where affiliated companies um, create like an alliance um, with the government and through that alliance they're able to um, get the best connection to the best suppliers, to the best manufacturers and the distributors um, with the government, they're with the government's recommendations. So they're getting the best for their countries for the, best, for the success of everyone. Next, I will talk about the relationships and communication. So 99% of Japan speaks Japanese, but everyone focuses on body language. Because they're, they're very peaceful and um, value harmony, they hate to put somebody on the spot and embarrass them. They hate to reject somebody's offer. They're just very, they depend mostly on body language. So you have to be aware of how you're um, acting. Even a, a single frown when you're talking to somebody, if you're frowning, they may take it as you, you know, disagreeing with them. Just with you frowning, but it could be just that you're thinking or you know, the like. Also, you want to always be respectful. And the way you greet properly is through the bow, you bow, um, and the lower you, you go, um, the more respect you have for that person. Also, um, when you want to meet with somebody on one-on-one, -on -one, you have to make an appointment. Um, we recommend you make the appointments two to three weeks in advance. You also have to call at least two hours before the appointment just to verify that you're still meeting with that person. Also, you want to do it through the telephone because um, they do not like it through the emails or letters or fax because they want to hear the person they're going to meet. They want to hear that um, voice. Next, I will move on to the business etiquette. So in business meetings, you cannot just go ahead and just seat yourself. You have to wait because there is a protocol. The honored guest or the eldest has to sit farthest away from the door in the center of the table. And then if it's, um, they do it younger, youngest to the door. Um, it's just a way of honoring the guest and to providing all the attention to that person in the center. Also, when you are negotiating with the um, with, Jap with Japanese, um, you all, they're very non-confrontational. They hate saying no. They hate rejecting. So you want to word your your 
questions around in a way that they can answer yes. So um, for, instead of them saying no, which is very, um, they hate saying no to somebody, you may like to question the, the you may like to word the question um, by saying, do you disagree? Which is making it easier for them to say yes. Also, it is a must to have business cards in Japan. You're nothing without your business cards. We recommend you have at least 100 cards per week that you spend in Japan. They are exchanged very constantly and there's a formal way of doing it. Um, you treat the business card as you would treat the person. Um, also, we recommend that you translate um, everything in the bag in Japanese because there will be people who speak English in Japan and of course everybody else does speak um, Japanese. So you want to be able to provide both languages. So today I did talk about the society and how they value harmony. Um, I also talked about relationships and communication. And last I talked about um, business etiquette and the importance of business cards. Thank you for listening. I would like to um, introduce our next topic, the economy. Hi, how are you all doing today? My name is, is Julian Salazar, as Cindy said in the beginning. I'm an um, international investing consultant. I've been doing this for five years and I love my job. So coming out here to talk to you about the economy of Japan is very exciting for me. So uh, let's get right into it. <coughs> I'm going to be covering three main points today. Past history, uh, Japan's current status, and then I'm going to be talking about economic statistics and the GDP of Japan. So let's get started. I'm going to first get into past history. We're going to begin around the Meiji Restoration. Before the Meiji Restoration, uh, Japan was in Japan was in a state of isolation for about 200 years uh, at the year 1633, and it didn't end until the mid 1800s, according to Time Rhyme, the Japanese timeline of the economy. <laughs> After that, during the Meiji Restoration, which I said was the uh, mid 1800s. Japan began to open up its borders to foreigners, mostly Westerners, Europeans, Americans. And it was during this time that Japan started to witness this sense of uh, industry. They began to they began to undertake an uh, industrial revolution. With this came uh, railroads, the locomotive, and an increase in military power. And lastly, with this came uh, the sense of Westernization. They began to adopt more Westernized uh, culture, clothing. Uh, foods, they started to uh, put away a lot of their their cultural heritage they originally came from. I'm going to fast forward a few years into World War II. As we all know, Japan lost the Pacific War after uh, Americans dropped bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And it was during this time that Japan enters a political and economic reform due to the loss. They abandoned their, their government of emperor and change that. And according to Thomas White Global um, Investing, that in 1951 Japan slowly rose out of this comp out of the the depths of war. And in 1951 they became the second largest e uh, economy in the world. So it just goes to show you how they start to rise out of basically defeat. And I'm going to get into this more later. Japan is going to be known for doing this. Okay, so the current economy. I'm going to start off in 1973. Japan uh, focuses on more manufacturing of electronic products rather than oil-based products. This is because Japan wants to try to be self-sustainable instead of depending on things such as oil like many countries are such as the United States. And uh, this is something that the, the Japanese have been used to, like I said before, in their, in their, um, in their period of isolation. That's why they want to be self-sustainable and not having to rely on anyone else. But this is uh, very significant. As we know today, Japan is really uh, is well known for their their electronics, TV, cell phones, things like that. And this uh, proved to be short-lived because in the 1990s, early 1990s, Japan and actually most of Asia started to become in a, started to go into a, a recession. It was more of an Asian recession. In order to escape this, Japan wanted to increase their exports to Western nations, and so this was during the rise of the automobile industry, especially with uh, companies such as Honda and Toyota. 
Okay, now I'm going to start getting to the GDP uh, per capita. As you can see, I included a, a diagram of the Japanese GDP for the decade. So we have from 2002 all the way to 2012. And you can see the different fluctuations that it tends to rise and it tends to fall, it tends to rise again. And so in 2012, is actually the highest that it's been to right now. This is also going on with the world recession, the recession that just came out of in the 90s, things such as that. <clears throat> okay, so just real quick, I don't have this on the slide, but I just want to let you know that the Japanese currency, as most of you probably already know, is the Japanese yen. One Japanese yen is equivalent to 0 0.01 of the US dollar. In other words, it's equal to a penny. Okay, so the average GDP per capita and throughout, I'm going to use the year 2011 as my example. Throughout the year 2011 was $2,335 billion. That was the average throughout the year. However, in the last month of December, it reached the highest it's ever been in Japanese history, which was $5,867 billion US dollars for their GDP. This is uh, equivalent to 9.46% I mean, yeah, of the world's economy. So it goes to show you that's already one tenth, showing how, uh, how successful Japan is rising. I got this information from trading economics uh, section of Japan's GDP. So it just goes to show you how, even during hard times, and we all know in 2011 that Japan witnessed a really horrible natural disaster. They were hit by an earthquake, and then after that, a tsunami, which put them in economic turmoil. And what didn't help was the Japanese nuclear power plant that also um, got hit, which just hit their economy pretty bad. And just to have them having one of the highest GDPs in December says a lot. So different things that I talked about with you today was the Japanese past, just showing how the, the, the country came to where it is now. I also talked about the present day status, their struggles and how they ever how they overcome them. And then I also talked about the Japanese GDP, so that way when you choose to invest and do business in Japan, you know what you're getting yourself into and you know uh, how your company will be doing later down the line. So next up in our presentation, we're going to be talking about Japanese business management. Uh, hello everyone, my name is Brennan Hoferkamp and I'm a graduate of the St. Edwards International School of Business and I've been working with the agency for over 10 years. And I'm going to give you a little overview of the uh, business management structure and style today. I'm going to be covering three main points. Um, first being the description and general outline of the upper management. Next we have the placement and advancement of employees in these large corporations. And finally, the benefits uh, and rewards that these employees receive from these corporations. So first, just a general uh, and a, uh, description of the upper management. Um, the managerial approach emphasizes a flow from uh, inf of information from bottom of the company to the top, uh, bottom being employees, and as it goes up through managers and through executives. Um, also, uh, an interesting fact is that the higher a manager rises um, through the ranks in his company, the more he will uh, seem unassuming or uninterested or unambitious. Uh, that's, a, that's according to uh, worldbusinessculture.com. And this is because uh, managers in Japanese companies um, uh, work as a facilitator rather than a source of authority. Uh, this is because, uh, well, never mind, sorry. Uh, chief executives, one of their main responsibilities is to um, watch over their employees and make sure they're all uh, in harm, working together in harmony, and they're very, um, they're communicating very well and they work well as a team. So next we're going to get into the employee placement and advancement. Uh, it is very crucial that if you want to work, if you're a Japanese uh, citizen and you want to work for a large um, company in your future, you need to attend a one of the top universities in Japan and get a top-notch education. Some of these uh, top universities include the University of Tokyo, uh, Kyoto University, and Osaka University. 
That was according to japantalk.com. Um, yeah, so the, the uh, excellent college is necessary, um, especially if you were, want to receive interest from large corporations. And this is getting uh, into my next point of permanent employment. It's a concept that these corporations use. It's almost like a recruiting technique where they'll go to um, universities and interview and talk with students. And um, ultimately, if, they're, if they think the student is uh, good enough to work for their company, they will give them an outline of what they would like out of the uh, future employee. It was, it's basically a roadmap from the start of their career to the end of retirement. And this is it's defined differently here in the US. That's, why, that's what makes it unique uh, to Japan. And finally, only the best and uh, young, only the best young workers will advance in these corporations. It's very competitive, um, and you, you're gonna have to work very hard if you're a Japanese employee and you want to climb in the ranks. So finally, I'm gonna be looking at some benefits and rewards that employees receive from uh, their companies. A huge uh, factor that plays a role in the distribution of rewards and benefits is the. Um, con is the concept of seniority. Um, this involves the uh, hot, the more experienced, older workers. They will receive more benefits and rewards. They'll have an advantage to younger employees. Um, while younger employees do start def uh, definitely with lower compensation, benefits, and rewards, they understand that eventually as they work their way through and work for the company uh, year by year, they will receive uh, more and achieve seniority themselves. Um, some intangible and tangible benefits that they receive are uh, housing assistance, vacations, recreational facilities, uh, and low-cost loans for automobiles or housing. And finally, semi-annual bonuses are usually common in these companies, um, especially if seasons, uh, for seasonal uh, bonuses like for Christmas, kind of similar to what we have here in the U.S., um, they'll give most of their employees a small bonus to pay and buy whatever they want. And also, they have, they give out bonuses based on performance, um, based on personal selling, for example, and personal success. So, in this section, in my section today, I uh, basically covered um, a general description and overview of the upper management and how it works in Japanese corporations. I discussed the placement and advancement of uh, employees for Jap large Japanese corporations, and I just went over some benefits and rewards that they, uh, employees often receive. So next, we're gonna get into how to start your own business in Japan. Hello everyone, my name is Brendan Mayer, as Cindy stated earlier in the presentation, and I have been a worker in this company for about seven years now. I graduated from St. Edward's University with a master's in international business. And I am going to talk to you all today about the process of starting a business. Uh, I'm going to cover three main topics, the first being the actual process of starting a business. Um, then I'm going to talk about the important laws. You remember there are some laws that I've highlighted that I think are kind of important when doing business in other countries, especially Japan. And then I'm going to talk about some potential markets to enter. So starting with uh, the process, first you want to make your company seal, which is pretty much um, the symbol of your company, uh, so to speak. Um, it has to be registered and um, trademarked by your company, which means that no other company or nobody else can really use your trademark because it's yours. Um, after that, you will file a notification of incorporation of the company opening a payroll office and application for approval of blue tax cross, uh, sorry, blue tax returns. So pretty much this is just kind of setting up um, the financial aspect of your up and coming company. Um, after that, you will apply for an issuance of company registration. So after you have your financials down, you are pretty much applying for um, registration. You're getting approval to actually start the company. Uh, next, you'll file a notification of the commencement of the business. So it's kind of like letting Japan know that you've gone through most of the process already, and so now you are ready to become a company. Um, I forgot to mention that this whole process generally takes about one to three months. Um, everything in Japan, for the most
most part runs on a schedule, so it's very important to be on time with everything that we do. Um, and lastly, um, you'll find notification of commencement of business and labor insurance, rules of employment and labor standards. So it's just like the rules of your employees, uh, standards, any kind of regulations. Um, so this is like the final step, you've been approved, you have the company, uh, everything is set up, and then that will be the start of it. So moving on to, um, sorry, this was all according to doingbusiness.org. Um, moving on to some important laws to remember. Um, like I said earlier, these are just some laws that I feel are important in doing business in Japan. Um, a lot of them are kind of like ones in the United States, but I'll get to that. So Article 32, Section 1 and 2, um, they state that a worker cannot work more than 40 hours a week and no more than eight hours a day. Um, that's pretty much how it is here in the United States, but I just wanted to make sure we remember that. Um, because especially when doing business in other companies, we sometimes forget, uh, I guess, some standards that we have ourselves, and we have to make sure that we are upholding those too. Uh, Article 25, Section 1, which is, uh, kind of talks about emergency salary, which means if an employee goes to the hospital or is involved in an accident, childbirth, illness, or anything like that, and they request their salary early, you have to, by law, give it to them uh, because it's going for like an emergency expense. Article 19 um, talks about not firing anybody on their rest periods. So Japan is very big on uh, making sure their employees that are also awesome, that are so very hardworking have their time off. And you cannot fire them for needing their time off or anything like that. You can also not fire any woman 30 days before or after her childbirth. Um, of course, that's important. Um, next is Article 37 which talks about overtime. So the overtime salary has to be at least 25% of, 25% um, increase of the regular salary, but no more than 50%. So pretty much just, it's just giving incentives to do overtime, but also paying the employees for, for all of the actual work that they're putting into the company. And lastly, Article 68, Section 1. It's a little different. Um, it says that, uh, Women on their menstrual cycles cannot be hired during that time period that they're on it. Um, I just thought it was pretty interesting myself. Uh, I, although I haven't quite found the reason why, sorry, although I haven't quite found the reason why it might be, I think it's probably because Japan um, feels very wholesome about their people, and so I guess just women on their cycles are different. Um, so, okay, next we're going to talk about, actually, yes, I'm going to talk about potential markets to get to. So, as we know, Japan is very big on exports. Um, their largest export is the Toyota, which also includes the Lexus line, because Toyota owns Lexus, because we didn't know. Um, they also have Mitsubishi, which is another large car company in Japan. Um, Nissan, which is another large car company, and Honda, which is the second largest export from Japan. And electronics-wise, uh, Japan has Sony, which is um, TVs, uh, computers, laptops, anything like that. Um, also Toshiba, which is a computer and laptop company, and Panasonic, which focuses more on sound and audio systems. So these are all really big part of the winter because they come out of Japan and are very successful. So to wrap up what I talked about today, I talked about the process of actually starting a business, which should not take more than about three months if everything is on time. Uh, I talked about some important laws to remember uh, when doing business in Japan or any other country, especially Japan. And then I talked about some potential markets to enter. Um, the car market in Japan is very large and electronics very large in Japan too, because Japan is very technologically savvy. And to wrap up our presentation, Cindy Castillo talked about um, the culture and says uh, business culture and uh, how Japan values harmony and working in unison. Uh, Jillian talked about the economy and how after every economic struggle, struggle Japan comes out on top and always regains its focus. Brendan Hufferkamp talked about upper business management and how it acts as a facilitation towards its employees. 
and then I talked about the actual process of starting business in Japan. And we collectively as a group would recommend that you uh, do go through the process of actually starting a business in Japan. We believe it would be very successful and with a great uh, margin for profit. And we would like to thank you all for coming to our presentation today. We will take any questions that you might have right now.